Happy New Year, everyone. Today is January 15th, and this is episode 18 of our Google Hangouts podcast and all things Doxis. I'm Brady Volp, founder of the Volp Firm and Nimble This. Again, we have our good friend, John Downey, CMTS technical leader at Cisco Systems. Hi, John. Great to have you back. Hey, thanks. Thank you very much. Good to see you again. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. So today we are um, we are also we are going to have uh, our our good friend David Haig on with us, but uh, due to some unforeseen circumstances, he was unable to attend. He's given us a rain check on that, so hopefully we'll have him on another show. Uh, we will be focusing on. We have a long list of Q and A questions in our mailbag that we're going to be focusing on. Uh, some items in the news: uh, Cable Labs has issued the first Doxus 3.1 certificates to five cable modem vendors. Among those to obtain the product certification were ASCII, CastleNet, Netgear, Technicolor, and UB Interactive. Uh, according to Cable Labs. The certification of five vendors marks the largest first certification wave for any DOCSIS specification. So this is uh, this is great. We got uh, a number of vendors with DOCSIS 3.1 cable modems out there. Um, yeah, I mean this, uh, Cisco sold off the the CPE portion of Cisco uh, cable modem set top box to Technicolor, and uh, it turns out the Technicolor out of France they're occupying one of our buildings in Atlanta right now. So basically nothing's really changed. <laughs> the Cisco guys that are working on cable modems are still working on cable modems, but they just have a different badge, you know, on their, on their shirt. Um, so they're, so Technicolor has their own reference design and they had a Cisco SA reference design. Uh, I don't know if they certified both of those designs or going with one or the other, but it was, um, good to know that we were always working in tangent with Technicolor anyway. And that was basically, I think what Comcast was using quite a bit was the Technicolor modems. Um, but I was also working with UB when I was there to interop uh, last time and, uh, and Am not Ambit, Ambit was UB, wasn't it? UB is Ambit. Is that right? Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> know, you know, there's so, so many acquisitions going on right now. It's a little <laughs> difficult to keep up with it, but I think they are one and the same. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, it's good to know that we're moving ahead, right? Yes, absolutely. We got we got modems in the pipeline for three one, and and like we said, we got more than one vendor on that. So, and it's also good to see the Technicolor there for uh, uh, from from your end. Uh, also, Cable Labs Winter Conference will be in Orlando, Florida, February 9th to twelfth. So there'll be more technology going on there. Um, I don't know if you're going to that. I'm not able to attend. But um, that will be going on. And then the following week, the NCTC Winter Educational Conference, or WEC, will be held in Phoenix, Arizona. I will be attending that. I'll be speaking uh, on a panel about DOCSIS 3.1 and FTTX. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, for cable operators uh, that are looking at 3.1 and looking at FTTX, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages uh, for each technology. So anyone that is considering going to NCTC, please be sure to attend my seminars on Monday in the afternoon. I think it's between from three to four o'clock. So I'd love to see you there in person. Um, it's a good time to be in Phoenix. Yes, in the middle of I'm hoping for some warmer weather there. So I'm <laughs> definitely looking forward to that. Um, also, uh, if you've seen on, on uh, the Volt Firm site, and I think on our Google Plus page, we are holding some competitions. So, you know, I've got the uh, I love uh, my PNM shirt on. We have a number of other PNM related shirts, but we're looking for people that um, are using uh, PNM solutions, whether it's our PNM solution or someone else's. Uh, please send in your success stories, and then we're looking for some of the top success stories to come in with videos and what you've done with PNM. And we'll be uh, sending off some T-shirts, uh, PNM T-shirts, uh, to people that are successfully using PNM and and also like PNM. So that's uh, part of what's going on there. So check your lo local listings on uh, how to participate in that. So very nice. So uh, uh, any any updates on your PNM, the Nimble This app? Uh, uh, yeah, so so we're just features? we're just getting ready to release version three. Um, I really don't want to go into the details of the features on on the Hangout. Those are kind of you know 
uh, on, the, on the hush hush and restricted to <laughs> our users and stuff. So, but yeah, there's a lot of really really cool features in version three that we're super excited about getting getting out to our user base and stuff. So. Uh, it's come a long way from where version one was, and then we released version two, and and now version three. It's it's uh, it's definitely. I have a I have a question for you. Have you personally seen any of the any modems deployed yet with the upstream spectrum analysis? Um, I've not seen them deployed uh, in in the in the wild um, yeah. with any of the any of the cable operators that we're working with. I have yeah. used them. I've tested them, and uh, so you know we've seen the return spectrum on them. Right. Some of the modems that we pull, um, as we, I, I, if yeah, I don't think you're you're on any of the ingenious working groups. As as what we've seen is you can still see through the diplex filter. You can see noise with a lot of attenuation below uh, 54 megahertz or below 42 so megahertz. Saying, so you're saying even if you don't have the actual upstream spectrum analysis feature that Broadcom was promoting, um, the normal downstream spectrum analysis, full bandwidth capture, you can sort of see some of the upstream anyway with that feature. Is that right. right? Uh, That's what you're saying. Yeah, basically what you're doing is looking through the attenuation yeah. of the diplex filter. So the noise has to be quite severe in order to see it. But we have seen cases where the noise is so severe in a home uh, that that noise will actually come up out of the diplex filter. We've we've only seen a couple of cases where it was that severe, but, but it made identifying the subscriber where that noise was emanating from very easy to detect in that case. Um, yeah, I was I was thinking more of the uh, the new feature. It was sort of new. It was actually what you reported last year at the winter conference, right? Yes. Where they activated, I think, an FPGA on the upstream side of the diplex filter. Correct. And now what, one of the, the latest things that, that we're working on in the Ingenious Working Group is a, uh, an update to the MIB that will allow us to switch that diplex filter out. Um, and, and we're leaving it up to the vendors to decide how they'll actually do that method to switch the diplex filter out so that we can basically say, OK, show us the frequency, the upstream spectrum from 5 to 42 megahertz or 5 to 65, 5 to 85, whatever that return split may be. and that will that will automatically be taken care of in the cable modem. The MIB will you just give us the return spectrum, um, so that even if they have that diplex filter in and they don't have the extra A to D like the Broadcom has, we can we can still see the return, and we'll do it very very quickly so that it won't yeah. be service impacting for the subscriber. So we we will have that feature in even more modems um, in in the future. So that that work yeah. is in process. So very excited about that as well. Cool. Yeah. So ready for some questions from our listeners? Yep, let's do it. So <laughs> um, first of all, I, I, you know, there's we have a, a lot of different outlets, and uh, I, I want to just uh, we we had one from uh, Gerald Borders that posted on our YouTube subscription page, and he just he said uh, just a week ago he said thanks guys for the great information for doc for a doc or he said it's great information for a Doxus engineer. You are my number one show, regardless if there are any competitions. So get your ribbon and wear it. This was about our post <laughs> on the number one Doxus. Uh, show. Then we had a question from Michael French. He said, Brady, do you have any forums or other ways people can ask questions? I'm a system tech and have a lot, a tons of questions that can never get answers to, mostly about pre-equalization and other advanced DOCSIS troubleshooting methods. So I, I wanted to take the opportunity to, to let everyone know we actually do have a bunch of different ways that people submit questions to us. Um, one, if, if you're watching live, there's a little Q&A button in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. You can click on that and, and submit a question. And if we're, if we're actually paying attention enough, we'll, we'll read those questions on live. If not, we'll get them afterwards and answer them. Uh, the other way you can do it, you can post to our Google Plus page, Volt Firm uh, Google Plus page. You can uh, submit questions to the Volt Firm um, blog page. You can submit questions to info at voltfirm.com. Uh, you can submit them. You can submit direct questions to our Twitter uh, feeds. So we have uh, Volt Firm is one of our Twitter page feeds. Nibble this, and also uh, at Brady Volt. So at Brady Volp, at Volp Firm, or at Nimble This. So we have uh, a number of ways that you can get questions in. John, I don't know if you have any any 
ones that you would recommend submitting to you or if that's enough to get questions yeah, from us? I mean, if, if it's related to this stuff, it's probably best that it comes through you and then you and I can address it. Uh, for Cisco specific questions, people usually just email me at jdowney at cisco.com. And usually that's, if I get to it, I get to it. <laughs> you know, I support globally, so uh, I never know what's going to come across my desk and where I'll be. Yep. So please, definitely, um, Michael and anyone else, please keep your questions coming in. We, we definitely try to get to them and answer them on air. Some of them we answer off air, and, and we'll try to address your questions as best we can. And also, as far as outlets, you can watch this show on YouTube. You can uh, get it through iTunes. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of uh, feeds that you can download the audio-only versions of, and then you can also watch it on the Volt Firm blog uh, directly as well. So there's a bunch of ways you can get it, and I know that um, uh, Android is coming up with a podcast very, very soon. We've already submitted, and, and we'll be on that as soon as the Android podcast comes out as well. So moving right along, um, we have a question from at Cox Cox. He's, that's a real name, uh, not, not a real name, but that's the user's name, at Cox Cox on our YouTube feed. He's asking, he has a follow-up question from our, our discussion last month on excluding devices from pre-equalization. So we talked about excluding like handheld test meters from pre-equalization and, and why, you know, pros and cons for doing this. But his question is, isn't upstream SNR calculated for the upstream card instead of an individual device? If all other devices are using pre-EQ, wouldn't that skew your results? So, I mean, the basic question is, if we exclude just a handheld test meter and we're looking, and we don't exclude all the cable modems, aren't we calculating upstream SNR and, and the other components of that based on the entire upstream I think, card? I think, yeah, I, I think the uh, confusion there is he's looking at the CMTS, like a show controller command or something like that. I have a command on CM, Cisco CMTS called show cable hop, uh, show cable hop threshold. That'll show me a column of all the upstream SNR, we call MER now, um, of all the upstreams, but that's of the entire upstream. But we also have commands to look at per modem MER. So I can do a show cable modem phi command, PHY, and that command on the Cisco CMTS, uh, I, for instance, I could say show cable modem C500 upstream 0 phi. So all the modems on upstream 0 of that interface uh, are going to show me the MER and the upstream transmit. There, there's some things I might have to activate to allow what we call remote query. Cable modem. Cable modem so remote the, query, so you'd have to add, yeah. activate. Yeah. yeah, that way the CMTS is, acts like an SNP agent, right? So the CMTS can query the modems for its upstream transit level and its downstream level as well. Now, what's interesting with DOCSIS 3.0 is if the modem is doing upstream bonding, that upstream transit level is known at the CMTS anyway. Because part of the spec says for 3.0 modems to go into MTC mode, which is upstream bonding mode, uh, they have to report their upstream transit level, even if remote query is not on. So here's a case where you don't have to turn on remote query. You don't have to activate the SNMP agent in the CMTS. Uh, you will get those modem transmit levels um, from the cable modem because it's already being transmitted according to the spec when, when the modem is doing MTC mode, it's upstream bonding. You're not going to get the downstream level and the downstream MER because you didn't turn on remote query. Um, but that, so there might be some columns or fields that are not populated unless you do turn on remote query. So, so that is that is something really interesting, I, and ex explains something to me that I didn't understand. Because there have been CMTSs that I've worked on, where the the um, the read-only community string for the the CMTS, the query to CMTS to get modem data for the SNMP monitoring system, was the same as the uh, the the read-only community string in the cable modem. And when that happens, you can't enable remote query on the CMTS, at, at least as far as I know, because it, if that community it's string is the risk. same, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it won't yeah. let you enable remote query. So I, I can't see if, you know, if I do show cable modem, uh, sh show normally, cable modem normally five, I'll go into this, yeah. Uh, if I do show cable modem phi, yeah, I know how to, I know how to get around it. <laughs> if I do uh -huh. show cable modem phi, I'll get a bunch of cable modems. Uh, without the the uh, RF statistics, 
but I'll, I'll get a, another set of cable modems with the RF statistics, and it was the DOCSIS 3 cable modems, and I couldn't understand why the DOCSIS 3 cable modems were reporting five statistics back without remote query enabled. <laughs> and I, I didn't know that that was a, a requirement. So is that, uh, is that all CMTSs then, that they're going to report that? Yeah, back? yeah. I mean, if you look at the 3.0 spec, when a modem does upstream ranging, he locks on one of the upstreams according to the UCD, and he says, all right, I'm going to range on the upstream, but i got to tell the modem or the CMTS what I'm actually transmitting so the CMTS can make a decision if that level is adequate for four-channel or two-channel or whatever bonding group you're trying to put them in for upstream. Right. So it's part of the MTC registration. Uh, MTC means multiple transmit channel set, right? I think that's what it is, channel set. Um, so for upstream bonding, according to the spec, the 3 modem has to report its upstream transit level. So the CMTS can say, all right, for one single channel, you are transmitting 55 dBmV. Well, you want to go to four-channel bonding, but 55 is not legal for 64 QAM. 51 is the max for four-channel upstream bonding. So we look at that and say, all right, well, is there any other commands in here to give us some headway? Like you know about the power adjust continue command? Mm -hmm. yeah. where we allow modems to stay online. But we have another command called uh, max channel power offset that's used just for 3.0 modems during registration. Defaults 4 dB or 3 dB. I've been setting it to 6 dB. So that modem that did transmit at 55, the same test is like, well, you're transmitting 55. You want to do four channel bonding, 51 is the max. But you set this other command to 6 dB. So anything between 57 and below, I'll let you come on full channel bonding. So that modem at 55, he's, you know, he's only ranging on the one channel. The CMTS will say, all right, I'll let you come online. And then the other upstreams will pop up. It might be 55, 56, 54.3, whatever. But it's still within the 51 of the spec plus this extra 6 dB I gave it in my CMTS. It's kind of a Band-Aid. Yeah, yeah, but it's, uh, it's nice to have that when you can't do the, <laughs> the remote query. At least you got some modems where you can, you can see levels and stuff. Um, now you did say it's a security risk. I, I I don't see the security risk with with using the. I think I think uh, because people were using the the default, which is public, right? The read only string is always public, and the read write string is private. Yeah. Uh, so most modems, right from the manufacturer, they have a read only string, an SNMP read only string of of public, you know, P U B L I C, and uh, people were using that on the remote query and the SNMP string on the CMTS, and I think. Uh, knowing that that's a, that's a default setting, I think that alone people thought was a security risk. Whether or not it really is, I'm not really a security guy, so I don't know. Uh, all I know is after we have certain iOS, I could no longer do exactly what you said, where I'd have the remote query as public and the SNMP manager, SNMP server read only public. I couldn't use that same word on both those settings. Yeah, and I, th I think you were going to say that the workaround is just shut down the manager and then you can use remote query. Yes. Right? Yeah. Well, I, not the SNMP server manager. That command has to be there. It's the SNMP server uh, read only. Read whatever. only string. Yeah. 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 It's just typically that, people shouldn't use a default, right? They should use something other than defaults. <laughs> yes, I know. I wrote an article about that a while ago about using defaults because there's been so much in the news lately about. Uh, hacking cable modems and there's been a, a number of issues like that so not naming any vendors but uh yes we want to get away from the defaults for a number of reasons yeah. <laughs> so, so, so that was kind of a long tiptoe around that first question <laughs> and i think that's the answer to that first question was yes if you exclude a device uh from pre-eq it's probably going to have a lower mer but that one device is not really going to change the average on an upstream that is 200 devices or 100 devices. But what we're talking about is excluding that one device from pre-EQ so that we can use other commands to look at that per modem MER, not the upstream MER, not the whole cha upstream channel MER, right? We want to get per modem MER. Yeah, and, and there's, I think, two, two ways that this could be used. This could be, you know, the engineer that's uh, at the CMTS looking at it, or it could be the the person that's using the handheld meter out in the field that's troubleshooting different points in the field, maybe you know doing a divide and conquer or looking at it end to line. So we want that handheld meter to be giving you uh, uh, a, a non-equalized reading, a non-pre-equalized reading. Yeah. 
Um, so that's why we'd want maybe want to exclude that meter from it. Um, in which case, the the average of the you know the upstream card is going to have absolutely no impact on that meter. So the the other thing it was uh, I was looking into this haven't gotten an answer back yet was. I know when a modem does pre-equalization, even if you then go to the CMTS and exclude it, the modem many times will just hold on to the equalization that it used last time. It's not being told to change by the CMTS, so it'll just stay where it is. But what so if you reboot the modem? You know, then that's where you clear it. So I'm trying to figure out, is there an SNMP MIB or a test command I could use on the CMTS to send a direct load which is a it's a CM, it's a pre q term direct load to the modem or the device to reset its equalizer taps. So I don't want to have to reset the modem, right? I don't want it to reboot. Yeah, the, so the, there's got to be a way that we can reset the taps. The the modem, I, I I think that would be critical to do if it's a handheld test meter. You're basically resetting that modem or powering it off and on so frequently that if you exclude that, it's probably not going to be a problem. Correct. That's Unless, not that big of a deal. Yeah, unless for some reason they persist, you know, if, there, if there's like a persistent memory that even after power off, the EQ values stay there, that, then that would be a real problem. Yeah, 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 and that shouldn't be the case. Yeah. Okay, so um, next question. This is from um, A, and I'm going to have a tough time with this last name. Uh, Widiyatmika? Yes, Widiyatmika. A-W, A-W. Yeah, there you go. Um, uh, it, they would like, uh, so hi, could I know what the, what is the minimum power level that the modem should transmit and what is, what are the factors that are involved? So, uh, so this is interesting because most people worry about the maximum transmit. Most people don't worry about the minimum transmit. And I'm, I'm glad this person brought it up because it is a concern. And I think we brought it up last time we were on one of these calls where I, I, I gave an example of. I had a customer or an engineer doing a lab test and in a lab, many times they set up splitters as diplex filters instead of real diplex filters. They uh, set up their cabling on the high and low side of a diplex filter, but they don't put proper padding in to force the modem to transmit n near the typical 40. You know, we want modems to transmit like 45, 48, somewhere in that range if we can. But the spec for 2.0 was they can range anywhere from 8 dBmV to like 61 if it was QPSK. You know, normally we'd see a modem start out at six and it would do nine and it would do like three dB increments, right? Might start at six and go six, nine, 12, 15, uh, 18. Then it seems just like, oh, I can see you now. So ramp yourself up to 38. And it does it and everyone's happy. It's plus or minus one. CMTS is happy. Kim modem's happy. Now with Doxus uh, 2.0, um, SCDMA, there was a minimum for that depending on the modulation, uh, depending on the, the what was it called? Uh, codes per frame or whatever the terminology was. I don't know if you remember any SCDMA stuff. Yeah, well, I didn't do much with SCDMA, but I, I, yeah, there are so many codes that you can have in, a, in, yeah. in an area. So, yeah. So it, it turned out with certain settings, there was a minimum, that, and it was very close to, it could have been as close as 40 dBmV. So I had some engineers do an SCDMA testing, and they're like, this modem won't come online. And sure enough, they didn't have proper padding in their lab, and the modem was transmitting typical, say, 28, 30 dBmV, which works fine for 2.0 modems, and normally works fine for 3.0 modems, but with SCDMA, it wouldn't work because of those certain settings and that minimum. Uh, when you look at DOCSIS 3.0, upstream bonding, there's a minimum there as well. I think for four-channel bonding, 64 qualm, the minimum is like 24 dBmV, assuming 6.4 megahertz channel width. So there is a minimum of like 24. Uh, then you might ask, well, what is a best practice? Like, is it really that big of a concern? Now, if I look at a typical diagram or uh, HFC plant and the first tap off an amplifier is a 23 dB tap and the last tap is a 4 dB tap, that modem off the 4 dB tap doesn't see much attenuation. Uh, depending on the coax loss and the flat loss of splitters and field equalizers or whatever's in line, uh, that modem might only be transmitting, say, 30 2 dBmV off the 4 dB tap. But the modem off the 23 dB tap, closer to the amplifier, uh, it's actually transmitting, because it has to overcome the 23 dB tap, it's transmitting 51, and it's working fine, whatever. But the one that's transmitting 35, you might say it's greater than 24, the minimum that the spec is saying, but is that good or bad? Uh, there's a couple of reasons why I say it's bad. 
One, if it's 35, that means any noise from that house is also only seeing 35 dB of attenuation from the house to the CMTS. Because that's what it took to overcome the attenuation, right? 35 dB. Uh, that's why I transmit in 35. So any noise from low value taps usually causes more problems for everybody. So if you have a modem only transmit in 35, that means there's not much attenuation, which means more noise is going to be uh, more, there's more effect from the noise from the house. The other one is if the modem's only 35 and it goes into la la land, I call it like a babbling set top box, what happens if it does happen to ramp up to 60? It can overcome a lot of splitters in the head end. <laughs> Yeah, it's going to it's going to overcome isolation head end, maybe show up on another port on the CMTS. It's going to maybe blow out the signal from port to port from your tap spigot to your neighbor's tap spigot. <laughs> your port to port splitter isolation in your house, it's going to hit the laser 25 dB higher than what it's supposed to. Because it ran it was normally only supposed to transmit 35, which hit the laser maybe at 10, whatever it was. And now it ramped all the way up to 60, so now it's hitting 25 dB higher than what it should be. So now you have laser clipping. Yeah, it, so, can, it can create a lot of, I think basically it can create, you know, we, we only think initially about the, it's going to have low SNR because it has low transmit value, and, and we think about the, just that modem, just that initial subscriber. What's funny about that right there, that's a fallacy too, because people think if it's transmitting low, it's a low MER, but that's not true. The, the digital front ends and all this equipment we use today is not a factor of what comes out of the, like the noise figure of the modem is not the issue. For the MER of a modem, it's the noise in the head end, which comes from everywhere, and the level hidden in the CMTS. Well, the level hidden in the CMTS is zero. Regardless of what that modem is transmitting, the level of the CMTS is still zero, and the noise floor is what it is. So that modem's MER is not based on the transmit level from that modem at all. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Like if, if, so like if I were to put a 10 dB pad on the front of that end of that modem, and now it's transmitting 45, you haven't changed a darn thing. Because the pad was not dropping any noise getting into the plant. You just, you just put a pad on the front end on the cable modem itself, which made it transmit 10 dB higher. And you're like, oh, now it's 45, so it should be better MER. No, it went through the pad and dropped back down to 35 anyway. And then it's going through the cable plant. Then the noise comes in through the drop line. Mm -hmm. It comes through the hard line, whatever. Yeah. And now I hell, still have the same MER. And this is why we say where you place the padding to make the modem transmit higher is what makes the big difference. If I place that padding at the tap, that's going to drop all the noise that comes from the house, that comes from the drop cable. Yeah. So I'm not just say forcing like the modem transmit higher, noise. you're adding attenuation. 90% of the noise or 80% of the noise is coming from the tap or in the home itself. So if we if we yes. by placing that tap that pad at the tap, then then we're increasing the cable modem signal above that ninety percent or eighty percent of the noise. This this yeah, and all that noise that happens to originate in that house and that drop line drops right. by the amount of the pad. Yeah, and, and then we can't just put a regular pad because then it would affect downstream, right? So we have to have like a step attenuator or some type of special tap that only has upstream attenuation and doesn't affect the downstream. That's what we're yeah. hoping, right? And there's, there's a lot of systems that are using those step attenuators that just attenuate the return. They have no impact on the forward. So, so I think the answer to the question was, uh, the question was about a minimum. Um, yeah, the minimum is about 24 dBmV, 23, 24, uh, but it is dependent, in, according to the spec, on the number of channels in the bonding group, the channel width, the modulation, I believe. Um, but regardless of that, you really should try to keep your modems transmitting 40 and above for the things that we just talked about. You know, if they go with la-la land, they could cause laser clipping. If they do happen to range higher, they could over, overcome isolation and head end and show up on an upstream port that they're not supposed to. Because normally you do have extra paths where the signal can reach other ports just because of different combining and splitting in the head end for different, different services like uh, your, your video on demand versus your status monitoring versus your upstream sweep equipment. There's a lot of paths where the signal can bleed across port-to-port -port splitters and show up on a port you don't think it should. Like an up, I can get a modem, say, and it R1 on upstream one, and I'm like, wait a minute, this modem is not physically wired upstream one. And then I draw the whole plan out. I'm like, well, actually, it is physically wired via my reverse sweep equipment. How often like, do you see that happen? Do you, have, do you see that frequently where you have that type of cross-isolation issue? Guys, most RF guys are good about that stuff. But um, I've, I've seen it 
more so from the customer putting a test modem in the head end and the test modem doesn't have the proper padding, meaning it's only transmitting like 28 dBmV. Now that modem has so much range left, it can definitely overcome 30 dB of isolation. Now it's up to 58 and it's showing up on another port. Normally yeah. out in the field, you know, you, you probably know, like when you look at the modem transmit bell curve, normally we're between 35 and 55, somewhere in that range. But if you get a modem that's, you know, transmitting 28, he has 30 dB of range left over. Well, I mean, we talk about this a lot. And one of the things that I don't like to do in a head end between the CMTS and the forward path transmitter is put an active device because that's a point of failure. If you have that active device fail, then your data is gone. So I, I normally, I use um, forward path combiners and splitters that have enough isolation between them. Um, that I, I, I reduce that. So, you know, I, I calculate, calculate the port to port isolation and make sure that I'm, I'm not going to have that at least in a forward path. But I did have a, a customer recently that insisted on putting amplifiers on every forward path of the CMTS. And we had discussions back and forth, but the, the customer won, of course. And um, we, have, we have amplifiers on every uh, forward path. Um, port that the CMTS is tied into. I'm less concerned about amplification it, 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 on video because yeah. video, that's not carrying voice traffic and, and st such. But uh, I wanted maybe your take on putting active devices between the CMTS and the forward path transmitter to, to prevent so what, isolation what he, specifically. So, so he really didn't need the amplification at all? He just used no, it because it was, the amplifier is a one-way device? Just isolation, just to stop isolation yeah. in a forward path. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, it's more equipment. It's a single point of failure. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't pr propose it. I'm not a proponent of it either. I think you can work out the design to get proper isolation um, without having to resort to isolation amplifiers. You know, these amplifiers he's using is not just to bump up the signal level. He's doing it so it's a one-way device. The so signal can't bleed backwards, right? right. Yes, correct. You know yeah, I, I mean, I guess you'd have to see the diagram, what they're really doing. Because when you really look at um, service groups and stuff, the video could be, is broadcast. Then you have VOD that's not broadcast, but maybe may feeding eight-node service group. Then the Doxus might be a one-node service group. Uh, Set-top box might be a four-node service group. And that's how you end up with these isolation issues is not every feature or every, every application is the same service group size. So you have extra splitters and combiners, and then you have signal that can bleed back and forth. Right. Yeah, so I, I, it's hard to say, right, without looking at it. But I, there's a lot of people that you know, don't use amplifiers on the downstream, but that same philosophy could be used in the upstream and say, well, could I use an amplifier in the upstream as an isolation amplifier? I'm like, yeah. I mean, typically coming out of your optical receiver and head end, you're coming out like 30 dBmV and you're hitting the CMTS at zero. You should have plenty of level there, right? 30 to zero. That You have 30 dB of uh, attenuation you can work with um, for splitting, combining, and all that. It's just a matter of, I think, drawing it out and making sure that signal is not bleeding back and forth because the isolation of a two-way splitter is dictated by the common port on that two-way splitter. If that common port is tied to a device that has low return loss, that's the reason why you have bad isolation. So if I have bad isolation, it might not be the splitter at all. It's because it's attached to a device that has poor return loss. And it's also... And maybe I just need to put a pad in there. Or, and if you have un, any unterminated ports on any of your yes. splitters and device, absolutely make exactly. sure you terminate them. Because exactly. an unterminated port turns that... It g gives you a great opportunity because it, it just reduces port-to-port -port isolation on all of your combiners and splitters. You know what's really scary is... You get to an eight-way splitter, and you see all the eight ports are tied to a cable, so you assume they're actually good. But then you find three of those cables are actually like antenna because they're just unterminated. They're not going the anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So in this case, an unterminated port is better than a coax cable attached to that port. Yes. yes that's that's going to create an antenna. <laughs> yeah. All right, so moving to the downstream, we have a question from Kevin South. He says, we have an analog system, 750 megahertz, have DOCSIS 3 CMTS. Can you tell me how to determine what level to run my four downstream channels for channel bonding? 
Example, taking levels on the transmitter test point for each node where the downstreams are injected. So, I mean, this is interesting. It's like you have a spec, the Durfee spec, right? Downstream radio frequency interface spec that says coming out of the port itself, if I'm doing four channel and four downstreams out of one connector, the most I can come out with is 50, 58? No. For 58? four downstreams, it's 52. I yeah. Think. No. I think it's more than that. For one, it's 60, 60 now. So track three or four puts me for two channel. You drop four, so that's 56. Yeah, you're right. It would be 52. It's like 52 or 53 or whatever, right? <laughs> All right. So let's say it is 52 to even be. Um, for, but for, he's not asking. You can humor me. You can humor me. See, I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. You're right. <laughs> two wrongs, I'm like, right, but three lefts do. Yeah. <laughs> so, so he's not asking what level I can get out of my CMTS or my edge qualm or whatever. He's asking what level to hit the laser, which is interesting because you should be able to hook up a test equipment to the test point. You can see all the other qualms in the analog channels. All you have to do is get it lined up with the regular analog, the other video or the qualm channels. You know what it's I've like, been seeing though more off, more and more often are people increasing the level of their DOCSIS qualm channels two or three dB higher than their video qualm because data is so important. They want to make sure that their, their data stays mm. running smooth. There's less interleaving of data channels. There's more, and what, you know, what interleaving yeah. is, if, if you get some noise in there, uh, it's going to impact because we have less interleaving of DOCSIS. It's going gonna, it's gonna to create data corruption of the DOCSIS channel. It's more noticeable for voice users, whereas video, we, we have more interleaving in our video channels. So you take a little data hit yeah. there, we're not going to notice it in a video. And, and if you inter interesting because the, the interleaving to me is more for impulse noise. And I don't really see a lot of impulse noise in a downstream. I'm sure it, you know, it happens. I get laser clipping. I do get impulse noise, but not a lot. Uh, yes, video has like a deep interleave, like a 128 by 4 or something mm -hmm. like that, whereas Docs is usually a 32 by 4. Um, and interleaving just helps to mix up the data. So if a big burst of noise comes in, as I de-interleave it at the cable modem, it looks like that noise was actually spread out in time. Right, so mm -hmm. if that noise is yeah. spread out in time, a couple of missed zeros and ones here and zero and one here, I can fix it with the forward error correction. Um, so yes, that's fine, but running a higher level would just give me better MER in general, right, above the noise floor. Of course, but there's still a spec for there's still a spec, right? It has to be six to ten dB below the closest analog channel. So if you were to put an analog channel there, it's supposed to be six to ten dB lower. I remember when we started out with sixty-four qualm on a downstream, everyone was doing ten dB lower. Absolutely, because yeah. sixty-four qualm was robust. And then we went to two fifty-six qualm. We jacked it up four dB to still hit the spec of six dB delta, yep. because we knew two fifty-six qualm was less robust. Uh, but if you're telling me they have two fifty-six qualm video and a two fifty-six qualm video or doxis and the doxis is higher, I suspect it's actually at a spec. Well, is, is the reason I, I'm telling you, I'm seeing this everywhere because we have full band capture modems, right? And so, uh, and we're running PNM, and I'm doing full band capture scans all over the place with different customers. And almost every time, I can pick out the block of QAM channels, whether the, you know they're doing <laughs> four or eight or sixteen channel bonding. I can look and and just visually inspect because those QAM channels in networks all over the world are wow. are uh, between two, four, or maybe even six dB higher than the an the video qualm, and 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 most of these you're you're talking about the analog channel. They're supposed to be lower, yeah, but yeah. but there's we're just getting you know all digital systems everywhere. Yeah. We're systems where there's just a few not, not tilt, right? thirteen video not tilt. channels. It it well the systems may be tilted, <laughs> you know, this but you tilted the whole see, way across. But you can yeah, see the yeah. qualm channel sticking up a few dB yeah. higher than the video qualm, the DOCSIS qualm channel sticking up than a few dB higher than the video qualm channels, and and yeah. uh, you know I, I don't know that this is a system like the 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 um, executives in the system are doing this, but when I talk to the plant guys, they're saying yeah we're bumping those up because we have modems at the end of the line that are you know, they're a little low and it, well, this just makes everything yeah, look yeah. a lot better. The modems are staying online longer. So it's, it, it might be just kind of like internal practice. So I, I, that's, that's what I'm you would think if, if you do something like that, now you can have potential um, channel to channel issues, right? Like that last video channel could be affected by the docs channel because it's a little bit higher in level. So the roll off kind of rolls into it, maybe. Um, 
then you would think, could I get laser clipping? But if I only have, you know, 16 doxis channels out of a hundred qualms, yeah, that ratio is not impacted at all. It's like one, less than one dB total extra power, right? Yeah. <laughs> so so really, like, no. Probably even less than that. You're probably talking in decimal points. Yeah, exactly. So, so, and, and if they have the power, they can do it maybe, but it's still, you know, you and I know it's a band aid, right? Yeah. I mean, proper, proper practices would be all the qualms are the same exact level going through your laser. Uh, and all your video would be at least 60 B higher, you know, peak to average ratio. Uh, Cause you do the peak on the video carrier for analog and, you know, we do average power for digital. Um, and that should be flat going into the laser. And then we do unity gain going out. So for them just to jack up a couple channels to overcome their poor design, <laughs> really is poor, kind of a poor design, right? They're, well, they're not, having low it, MBR. It, it's long. not a poor design. It's a non-optimal design, John. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Or maybe it's not the design. It's just, it, it is what it is, right? I mean, it, it, it's end of line and someone tried to extend the cable plant one more span of cable when it should have been another amplifier placed in there or something, right? Yeah. So I, I think the, the final answer for question for uh, Kevin is that, you know, ideally we'd like the qualm channels to be at the same level as the, as the video qualm channels. Um, yeah. If you don't have uh, other video qualm channels, then the, the qualm, the DOCSIS qualm channels should be 60 B lower than the video, the analog video channels. Um, and that would, you know, with that a, with a stipulation that they know what they're looking at, right? They have test equipment, they can do digital average power. Yes. So on a spectrum analyzer with a resolution bandwidth filter of 300 kilohertz, which is typical, right? 300 kilohertz RBW, yep. that's usually uh, a 13 dB correction factor, I think. So six dB lower should really look 20 dB lower in a spectrum analyzer. Yeah. Using 300 kilohertz RBW. I, I'm thinking of the top of my head. Yeah, no, I think you're, you're pretty close there on the numbers. So. All right, so um, question from Irene. She's been really looking at the DOCSIS spec. Um, she would like to know what the coding scheme is used to generate 64 QAM. So I, I know the coding scheme for, um, for Annex B is gray code. Um, I believe I, I didn't look up for and and because I'm, I'm now that I'm thinking about this I, I didn't look up for Annex A and Annex C um, So Annex B is what's used in the United States Annex A is used in um, I believe in Europe, also Europe. and uh, An Annex C is used in Japan um, I don't know if Annex C is used anywhere else um, so anyhow gray code um, is Basically, gray code tells you where, like, the different ones and zeros or groups of ones and zeros go on if you're used to looking at a constellation diagram. And what it does is it makes sure that your all your bits, you don't end up with all your, your zeros in one box, and then the exact next box up, you end up with, you know, like, zero, 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 one, and then the next. Uh, so gray code tries to shift that around and put your zeros here and then your 00001 in another quadrant. And by doing that, it, it reduces the probability that you're gonna end up with an error just a little bit. It's kind of like an error correction method, but it's, um, you know, it's not as effective an error correction as Reed Solomon or what we're talking about in DOCSIS 3.1 of LDPC. So you can look up gray code on Wikipedia and it'll, it'll tell you all the details that, you know, the guy with the last name of Gray, uh, invented it. That's why it's called gray code, and it was done back uh, in the late, in, in like 1950 or late 40s or something like that. So there's technology behind why they so came my, up. My, with that. E my easy explanation is I usually show a constellation of QPSK, and QPSK is uh, four symbols, right? Uh, we manipulate uh, by 90 degrees the frequency, right, to make QP quadrature phase shift king. And because we have four different symbols in QPSK, we have how many bits does it take to make four symbols? Well, it takes two bits, a zero, zero, a zero, one, a one, zero, a one, one. So it's zero, one, two, three, right? Four different symbols. But in gray coding, instead of doing the symbol landing for zero, zero in this quadrant and zero, one, and then one, zero, and one, one, we do zero, 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 one, 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 and one, zero. So we take three and two and swip them, sw uh, swap them. That way, when you look from quadrant to quadrant and you look at the actual numbers, only one bit is different. 
That way, if you have what we call inner symbol interference, uh, and a and a noise happens to make that bit fall over here, well, yeah, it's not exactly what I wanted. I wanted a zero zero, but that symbol actually is kind of funky. Uh, it looks like a one a, a zero one. Uh, it's only off by one bit, so it's uh, the gray coding makes it. I think, like you said, more efficient as if I have say symbols landing into the next block or inter, inter symbol interference. I'm only going to be off by one bit, and that's gray coding. I don't know if her, her, was it her, him? I don't know. Yeah, Eileen, right? Eileen. I, so I, I don't I know if her question. Yeah, I don't know if her question was based on like asking about gray coding uh, for 64 qualm. It just seems like strange. That it seems kind of vague what that question really was. Well, if if we didn't answer her question, then I I'll ask that she comes back. Get another one. Ask it. <laughs> ask it in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, we we just got a, a question come came in ah, from 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 our other friend Steve Williams, who who we know. <laughs> <laughs> Can you go back over the zero one zero zero one one order again, John? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> Zero zero <laughs> one zero one 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 zero. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> yeah. I, I think you need the whiteboard and you need to send it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, we're going to take our last question here, not from Steve Williams, but Kevin Duclos. It says, I'm experiencing an issue migrating a property from hardline coax to fiber backbone. The CMs are experiencing doc. Are, are DOCSIS 3.0 and bonding only on one of two upstream channels. The channel that fails is registering 10 dB difference lower in power level. Is there a common reason for this? I wonder where he means it's measuring lower. Where is he measuring it? He must be measuring it maybe at the head end or like I, I got to wonder if uh, the modem's already maxed out in power as much as it can do and there's su superior or super roll off and two of his, some of his frequencies are in the roll off, which is more attenuation. So the modem's maxed out power, say 51 dBmV and it's seeing more attenuation. So it's looking like 10 dB lower at his test point. Yeah. Well, let, I mean, let's, if, if he's going from coax, so he must be, they, they must be moving like uh, uh, tying this in from where they used to have a head end that was fed with coax and they must be putting a fiber node there and now running this back into a master head end. So they've introduced a new fiber node that didn't used to be there where there, you know, was maybe probably a, a head end tying this into, it's probably a system that was bought perhaps. I'm, I'm speculating. So I'm, I'm wondering yeah. if, if now this new fiber node that they've put in and, and removed the existing system that was there um, doesn't have, you know, like what you're saying, doesn't have a diplex filter that they didn't previously have. Yeah. And or, so or are we saying that it, or are we saying that it does now have a diplex filter that it didn't have before? Yeah. Cause like you said before, a lot of times systems, you know, the, the way people would put a system together, they wouldn't use a diplex filter. They would just, they would just, Use a splitter as a diplex filter. Put a splitter, splitter as a diplex filter. Okay. So they may have been yeah. running this. Um, so, you know, what I, would, what I would propose to Kevin is, Kevin, you know, are you running this channel that's 10 dB lower? Are, is, are you running that maybe really close to 42? I don't know if you have a 42 yeah. megahertz return or a 65 megahertz return, 85 megahertz return even. Is, is this channel that's 10 dB low, is it really, really close to your diplex filter? And if so, can you move that channel lower in frequency away from the diplex filter and see if now you don't have a 10 dB difference because part of what happens if, if you know assuming maybe you have pre-equalization turned on or maybe you don't even have pre-equalization turned on but if if diplex filters roll off um, so that's you know diplex filter has a low pass filter on one end and a high pass filter on the other the low pass filter is going to be where your return band ends at 42 65 85 megahertz and if that if that upper channel was rolling off, it, it could be attenuating. It could be attenuating it by 10 dB, uh, or the yeah. pre-equalizer is trying to compensate for the roll off, which is which takes up power, takes up RF power to compensate, and that could be part of the 10 dB difference. So, and without nice, knowing exactly nice to know where, frequencies. 
Yeah, exactly. Without, just, with those frequencies. without knowing your frequencies, it, it, it's really difficult to tell. But that would—that's what I would expect. That's what I would speculate, and where I'd start looking first is thinking that it's yeah. It's, the other one, the other one could be you know he's upgrading plant. He could easily have a connector that wasn't torqued down properly. He could have a suck out. He could have a suck out at thirty megahertz. That's six megahertz wide, taking out two channels. Yeah, absolutely. So unless you know, we, it'd be good to know his upstream frequencies. Um, and then, really, you probably should do an upstream sweep. Yeah, sweep the return. Flat. Yeah. Good call. All right. So we got through most of our questions, but one um, in 51 minutes of our standard 15-minute podcast. So, John, as always, it was a pleasure. And everyone else, please keep your questions coming in. We'll, uh, we'll get to We have, I have a schedule already for next month, so we'll look forward to another podcast then. John, take care. Everyone, take care. You Bye. Too. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.